How do Christians remember Jesus' death? Is it a new Sabbath day? Or did Christ give us something? The Bible tells us that Romans chapter 6 verse 3, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Has Christ given us something to remember His resurrection? Yes. Is it a new Sabbath? No. What is it? Baptism. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in a newness of life. The death, burial, resurrection of the Lord is not replaced by a new uh, Sabbath day. It is memorialized by baptism. It's a reminder of the resurrection. Colossians 2.12 Buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. Isn't that clear? Say Amen. amen. You're, I think you're very quiet today. Did you catch the switcheroo? He asked how Christians are to remember Jesus' death and then said, resurrection. No, Doug, baptism isn't about remembering Jesus' death. That is not what Paul said in Romans 6. Nor does he say baptism was given to remember the resurrection. That's not what was said in those verses especially for people who oftentimes are holding others like we showed last week to the standard of the verbatim fallacy. There's nothing in there about a memorial. Where's the word memorial in there, Doug? Show me one verse in there or one word in there where it, where, where it says in that verse memorial. That's the standard you were holding us to last week. But first, the claim is not that the first day is to remember Jesus' death or resurrection, but redemption. We went through that last week and, and ad nauseum on this platform at this point, which was accomplished by that work of resurrection. Not just that, but that was the final step. And that brought about the new creation. The creation that fell was redeemed, which is why Exodus roots the Sabbath in creation and Deuteronomy roots it in redemption. SDAs do not see this because they often are not being taught to look at the entirety of the biblical narrative or when they can't even look at it without the great controversy theme to do the filtering for them. But instead, they look at it in small sound bites from all over the place that seem to, to, to fit with what they're claiming or they think do, like Doug just did. Oh, it talks about baptism and talks about us. And so it, it, baptism is a memorial. The, the great controversy theme, folks, completely obstructs the SDA mind from being able to rightly see what Christ's coming was actually about. Because in their system, it wasn't to accomplish redemption. No, it was primarily to vindicate God against accusations made by Satan in a pre-earth existence. And that process entails a seven-step program, seriously, <laughs> their entire sanctuary model of seven steps, which Jesus is currently going through himself, and he's at step five, the investigative judgment. Until this entire chain of stuff is complete, Jesus is still working on redemption because redemption actually revolves around vindicating his character against the accusations of a creature, namely Satan. So because this is the case, they do not understand what Jesus actually accomplished in his perfect obedience in a sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection. Which is again why we have not heard a single mention of new creation yet. But this is how interpretation works in Adventism. The great controversy theme is the lens through which everything in Scripture must be understood. Paul hinges the entirety of the good news on the person and work of Jesus. And hinges all of that on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. If he didn't resurrect, it's all in vain. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. Which is why in Romans 1-4, uh, it says the resurrection was the demonstration that he was who he says he was. Because if he would have remained in the tomb, it would have demonstrated he was a sinner. He died just like everyone else did and remained dead. But the fact that he resurrected demonstrated he was who he says he was. There's a lot that hinges on this. And baptism does not point to Jesus' resurrection. Both the person and work of Christ hinge on that final step. But furthermore, Doug is simply reiterating, as expected. Ellen White here, who claimed this in Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, notice, quote, 
I saw that angels were filled with amazement as they beheld the sufferings and death of the King of glory. But I saw that it was no marvel to the angelic host that the Lord of life and glory, who filled all heaven with joy and splendor, should break the bands of death and walk forth from his prison house a triumphant conqueror. And if either of these events should be commemorated by a day of rest, it is the crucifixion. But I saw that neither of those events were designed to alter or abolish God's law, but they give the strongest proof of its immutability. Both of these important events have their memorials. By partaking of the Lord's Supper, the broken bread and the fruit of the vine, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. By observing this memorial, the scenes of his sufferings and death are brought fresh to our minds. The resurrection of Christ is commemorated by our being buried with him by baptism and raised up out of the watery grave in likeness of his resurrection to live in newness of life. Close quote. So Doug is basically just making the same claim. She claimed to be shown by God that neither the crucifixion or the resurrection were designed to alter or abolish the law, which first day Sabbatarians are not claiming this. <laughs> and again, when the Adventist church makes these arguments against Christians, it's really only against first day Sabbatarians at the end of the day because other Christians don't even agree on categorically the same thing here. So these arguments basically just have to be made against first day Sabbatarians and they don't work they, They're It's irrelevant. But Doug made these same assumptions like he did last week that uh, it, it just it clearly shows an erroneous understanding. It's not claiming the law was abolished, but nevertheless, the telltale sign that she didn't receive this from God is that God himself changes the form of the fourth commandment in the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy. We looked at that last week. We've looked at that countless times. We have countless articles on this on the website. Clearly, Ellen didn't know what she criticized either. And either did the person who supposedly gave her this vision. But the point, as you can see, she claims the resurrection was memorialized by baptism, or is rather, when no, it isn't. How could a one-time ceremonial ordinance be how we remember the resurrection? Like they'll claim the weekly Sabbath is how one remembers the creator of heaven and earth by virtue of it being weekly and regularly occurring. But here they'll point to a one-time event, baptism, to say it memorializes the resurrection. That's not how memorials work. She's correct. The Lord's Supper, in part, is a memorial of the death of Christ. That's not all it is, but it is in part. But even that doesn't function like a memorial in Adventism. It's done every 13th week or something like that, like four times a year, not weekly. Nevertheless, uh, baptism is a sign and seal of regeneration. And that's what Paul is getting at in Romans 6. Not that it's a memorial of the resurrection. Notice what Charles, uh, we're going to get back in Hodge's commentary here. We looked at him last week in regards to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But notice what he lays out here. And I could have picked a number of people. So speaking on Romans 6, this is from his Romans commentary. He says, quote, As the gospel reveals the only effectual method of justification, so also it alone can secure the sanctification of men. To exhibit this truth is to uh, uh, is the object of this and the following chapter. The sixth is partly argumentative and partly exhortatory. In verses 1 through 11, the apostle shows how unfounded is the objection that gratuitous justification, meaning justification freely given by God, leads to the indulgences of sin. Get that. Doug cited from verse from Romans 6, 3 and 4. Hodge points out, which we're going to look at, in verses 1 through 11, the apostle shows how unfounded is the objection that gratuitous justification leads to the indulgences of sin. That is what is in view in Romans 6. In verses 12 through 23, he exhorts Christians to live agreeably to the nature and design of the gospel and presents various considerations adapted to secure their obedience to this exhortation. So notice, folks, Paul is building an argument and laying out a theology as the book of Romans is unfolding. And the reason we're going to dig in on this for, for a minute, even though this isn't a super big point that he made, is it's going to prove a bigger point of how the SDA church is known to handle the Bible. And that will become much clearer as we go along here. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with the nature of fallen man and the horrible condition he is in apart from Christ, both Jew and Gentile alike. Apart from Christ, all are unrighteous and fall short of the glory of God. 
that's the summation of ver of chapters one through three. Chapters four and five then deal with the remedy to that problem, and he then uses Abraham as an example, pointing to Genesis 15. He says Abraham was credited uh, righteousness when he believed God, and it was that faith in God, belief and trust in him that justified him, using that as the example of the freely given grace of, or, or justification of God, which would mean justification has to do with being seen as righteous in God's sight. If Abraham was credited righteousness based on his belief and he was justified, that means that justification has to do with righteousness in God's sight. He then explains that this justification brings a sinner to peace with God, Romans 5.1. And then in five through chapter 5, he then explains how fallen man is born with uh, the first Adam as their representative. But when one believes the gospel, they are transferred from the fallen condemned family of Adam into the righteous family of Jesus Christ. Uh, who as the second Adam is then their new representative that they are seen as righteous in. Transfer from a kingdom of darkness to kingdom of light. This is a consistent theme with Paul. He talks about this in first Corinthians as well. The, the first Adam and the second Adam, etc. It's first Corinthians 15. But by the time he gets to chapter six, all of that has already been laid out. That's the flow of where we're at in the text now. The apostle then transitions to the objections that someone could bring to what he's presented thus far. Namely, that if it's the case that a person is freely justified by faith apart from works of the law, then why wouldn't someone just use that as a license to sin? He anticipates that question. He does this regularly throughout Romans. He does the same thing in chapter 9. Which is exactly why he starts 6.1 by saying, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So he asks this rhetorically as an example of someone who might bring this charge against what he just said. And Hodge rightly points out that Paul in verses 1 through 11 is refuting that charge by explaining that the freely justifying act of God upon a sinner does not produce licentiousness. Because there's far more to it than that. It's not... It, people are made a new creature in Christ. They have new desire. I mean, there's all sorts of things. They're born again. So Paul is essentially squashing that. Now notice what Hodge points out in verses three and four, which is what Doug cited. Commenting on verse three, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Hodge then comments, the apostle reminds his readers that the very design of Christianity was to deliver men from sin, that everyone who embraced it embraced it for that object, and therefore it was a contradiction in terms to suppose that any should come to Christ to be delivered from sin in order that they might live in it. And besides, or besides this, it is clearly intimated that such is not only the design of the gospel and the object of which it is embraced by all who cordially receive it, but also that the result or necessary effect of union with Christ is a particular or is a participation in the benefits of his death. We're going to read that again. And besides this, it is clearly intimated that such is not only the design of the gospel and the object of which it is embraced by all who cordially receive it, but also that the result or necessary effect of union with Christ is a participation in the benefits of his death. So contrary to the SDA church often claiming those Sunday Christians, they don't believe in obedience. They don't think Jesus actually frees people from sin. They have a powerless gospel. Let this be a testament that no, they're yet again wrong. Christians disagree with the SDA church's false doctrine around sinless perfectionism, which then results in them engaging in the false dilemma fallacy of thinking, if you disagree with them, you must be advocating for living it up in sin, as if those are the only two options when that's not the case at all. But Paul here is laying out that baptism is a sign and seal of having union with Christ through his death. Hodge continues. When it is said that the Hebrews were baptized unto Moses, 1 Corinthians 10, 2, or when the apostle asks the Corinthians, were you baptized unto the name of Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, or when we are said to be baptized unto Christ, the meaning is they were baptized in reference to Moses, Paul, or Christ, i.e. to be brought into union with them as their disciples or worshipers, as the case may be. In like manner, in the expression baptized into his death, the preposition expresses the design and the result. The meaning, therefore, is we were baptized in order that we should die with him, i.e. that we should be united to him in his death and be partakers of its benefits. 
Paul does not design to teach that the sacrament of baptism from any inherent virtue in the right or from any supernatural power in him who administers it or from any uniformity attending divine influence always secures the regeneration of the soul. This is contrary both to this is contrary both to scripture and experience. No fact is more obvious than that thousands of the baptized are unregenerate. It cannot be, therefore, that the apostle intends to say that all who are baptized are thereby savingly united to Christ. It is not of the efficacy of baptism as an external right that he assumes his readers are well informed. It is of the import and design of that sacrament and the nature of the union with Christ of which baptism is the sign and seal. Close quote. So by baptized into his death, Hodge argues that the grammar, remember, the only approved hermeneutic in the SDA church, historical grammatical method. Okay, well, that's what Hodge is utilizing because that's where they got this from. <laughs> Hodge argues, uh, argues that the grammar expresses the idea of baptism being a sign and seal of a person's union with Christ. Now, not all Christians agree with this, such as our Lutheran friends, but the purpose of this was in showing or the purpose in showing this was not to convince you of the reformed understanding of baptism, but to show this verse has nothing to do with baptism being a memorial of Jesus's death. <laughs> Paul is transitioning to responding to hypothetical arguments people could bring up against what he said regarding justification, such that if one is justified apart from works, why not just live it up in sin so grace can abound? He shuts that down by stating that the true Christian united to Christ was buried with him in baptism and one who is truly united to Christ doesn't have such a mindset. He is pointing to baptism, the sign and seal of union with Christ in his death, to highlight that. The same thing is being said by Paul in Colossians 2, which actually shows the connection between baptism in the new covenant and circumcision in the old. Like I said in part one, there are old covenant forms, namely circumcision, Passover, and the seventh-day Sabbath. In the new creation, those old covenant forms take on new covenant forms. Passover to the Lord's Supper, circumcision to baptism, seventh-day Sabbath to the first-day Sabbath. So no, Doug, it isn't clear that Colossians 2 is saying that baptism is a memorial of the resurrection. And again, this whole presentation so far, Doug has held others to the verbatim fallacy, yet neither of the text that he appealed to, neither of them, used the word memorial. And Doug, you still aren't utilizing the HGM, which Ted Wilson told us is the only approved hermeneutical method of the SDA church. You just cite verses, make assertions, and move along. Romans 6 and Colossians 2 pose literally zero problems for the Christian Sabbath position. But Colossians 2 actually does pose serious issues for your guys' position, as we're going to look at later since he mentions it again. But Doug here is beating up a straw man. He's seeking to refute the claim that the first day is not a memorial of Jesus's resurrection when first day Sabbatarians do not claim the first day is a memorial of the resurrection. It is a memorial of the new creation, the redemption, the work that was accomplished by the Lord Jesus, which the old sign, again, we talked about in part one. The seventh day pointed to that work that would be accomplished, just like circumcision pointed to it, just like Passover pointed to it, etc., when that has come to pass, there are now new forms in the new creation in the new covenant. The resurrection was the turning point from the old creation to the new. That's why resurrection is pointed to and celebrated. But the root is in what the resurrection demonstrates, which is that redemption was accomplished and the new creation has come. Exodus 20, roots it in creation. Deuteronomy 5, roots it in redemption. That's exactly what it's still rooted in. It just has a new form in the new covenant. And as was pointed out in the last part, Adventists, the ceremonial form of the fourth commandment not only can change, but has changed <laughs> multiple times in scripture. Not just after man fell into sin, but then in the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy, and then again in the new creation. 